So Scott, how much uh, habitat have those projects opened up on the barriers removal? How many miles? Of 50, this will, 62 total. 62 miles yeah. of stream that now are accessible by migratory fish. That's phenomenal. And it, you know, <laughs> good work. We've got a long way to go. I mean, this started out, and I, there's a dam safety database New York State has, and there's like 7,000 barriers uh, that are over six feet high on, on streams and waterways in New York. And you could expand that anywhere across the nation and globe. So we have severely impacted our flow regimes, um, which really are an impairment to migratory fish. And this kind of work is going to make a big difference over time. You know, you, you think about uh, how old some of these structures are and maybe 100 years of inability for a fish species to access these higher areas and watershed uh, that now they can to fulfill their life cycle is no small matter. So I just thank you guys for that work. Um, today, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the work I do as director of, of the Thousand Islands Biological Station. If you want to look at it, you can just look out through the snow and ice. It's right out the window here, little tiny island, Governor's Island, uh, which has changed my and a lot of people's lives. But uh, we do uh, aquatic ecology research and management work um, through the College of Environmental Science and Forestry with all our great partners. Um, one of the uh, more significant ones being Save the River. Uh, I don't know how many times I've given a talk in this venue. It's great to be back. I think. I was at the first one back in 1990, gave a talk, and uh, I, I must have done it at least a dozen times. But every time, it's one of my favorite audiences to speak with because you guys care and, uh, so much about the river and its ecosystem and, and the future that you're here spending your time volunteering and engaged, which is a model that I think if we spread across uh, the globe would, would do so much good uh, for so many places. So. Uh, thank you for, for your attendance. Um, so I got to get right to it. So we're, we're going to talk about uh, fish. And um, we have quite a, a diversity of fish here in this north temperate ecosystem, OK? So it's, it's a glaciated place. So it's really young, geologically young. And uh, there were refugia while the glacier was here where, where fish existed. And uh, even before um, people were here. and. Uh, uh, a lot of these uh, species are uh, from those refugia that migrated back to the St. Lawrence River. I'm not going to lecture too much about it, but we're going to focus today on, on the sport fish. Uh, the sport fish are the ones that bring the dollars in. But we have this philosophy when we enhance sport fish habitat, there's a whole lot of other stuff that comes along with that in terms of the biodiversity of this great place. So we're not just thinking in a vacuum about trying to, to produce fish like a factory. It's really uh, when we enhance habitat, like flow regimes or, or a connectivity in an ecosystem, it benefits so many species uh, that, that are part of this ecosystem. So that's, that's where uh, the dollars that come into sport fish really help uh, all aspects of the environment. OK, so I'm going to get into uh, some data. I'm sorry, I can't help it. I work a lot with data, so please bear with me. Um, but there's, there's uh, some really important data sets that allow us to track what's going on in the system. Um, there, there's a lot of things we don't measure, but there was some people I really have to tip my hat to that started early data sets. And, and so there's some good things that come out of bad things. Um, I remember when we had the winter navigation studies, there was a, uh, an effort that created this organization, really. And it also created some, some monitoring on the river that's really important. So long-term data allows us to understand uh, changes in the ecosystem, changes in fish populations. And, and the New York State DEC uh, started a gill netting series here in the river. Uh, in the late 1970s, and they, this is a lot of work. So when you see a data point, you know, it's, it's good to think about the amount of work that went into uh, collecting that. We saw that with Lee's turn work, um, the number of volunteers. It's no different with this. Uh, they, they, every year uh, in late July and August, uh, set out 32 gill nets 
in a, in a scientific manner um, uh, with great professionalism. And uh, the gill nets are then picked and, and uh, the data are collected on the fish, data on uh, the numbers, the different types in the catch. Um, they age each of the fish and, and learn about their age structure. They look in their stomachs to see what they're eating. It's, it, and they spend like the entire winter working on this. So just going out and making that fish collection is just like the beginning of a long, long process of a whole bunch of people hard at work to collect this kind of information over this long period. So it's just a remarkable effort to get these special data that we're able to use. And you can get these uh, in the Lake Ontario reports. They're available online. So if you really want to dig in, if, if you're a data geek, you can get into these numbers and, and there's these big thick reports full with fisheries information that are, are kind of critical. Um, but this is uh, the smallmouth bass data set and it, it goes back to 1977 and I must note that in 1982 they, they changed from 16 gill net sets to 32. So there was kind of a change in the amount of effort they imposed uh, with these gill net, standardized gill net data. And you can see that there's kind of a fluctuating population of bass. And, and we think about all the ecological changes that have occurred in the river over this time, um, but uh, bass have persisted with uh, changes like the dracinids, the zebra mussels coming in, um, all the nutrient inputs, then the Clean Water Act kind of changing the river and the amount of nutrients in it, and also uh, things like round gobies coming into the system, uh, an explosion in populations of double-crested cormorants, um, which, which eat a lot of fish. So there's, there's a lot of ecological changes that have happened in this ecosystem in a short amount of time, yet our fish populations persist. Um, and, and, you know, we call that uh, ecological resilience. Um, and so these, uh, these fish populations are variable, but we can, we can study them and, and, and they're not like uh, static. So this is one graph, this is what we call a length-weight relationship. It's the relationship between a fish's total length and how much it weighs. So we can, we can kind of get an idea of the, the condition of the fish. And when you look at this graph, it looks a little different. You see three different lines, uh, the 1980s and dark, and then there's an intermediate line from 1993 to 2004, and then the more recent period, which represents since the round goby was introduced to the system. Um, the diets of, of bass have, have changed to really focus on round goby, and it's made them fatter, okay? So that we've seen an increase in condition in bass. Uh, we've published some papers on this, and this has happened uh, many places where, where round goby um, have come into the system, and it hasn't happened equally with all species. Uh, species like northern pike do not show this response. We know that pike eat some gobies, but they haven't had uh, uh, that much of a, a condition or dietary intake uh, change. So we got these really big fat bass and all the anglers, I see Jeff shaking his head, you know, it's really changed uh, the ecosystem and fishery and the distribution of forage in the system. And, and it's, it's a big, big ecological change. Um, but there's, with every change, there's trade-offs, okay? So here's, here's a picture of a, a big round goby. Which one's the point? Yep. Okay. Um, so there's a big round goby here, uh, which is feeding our, our bass, and they're getting very fat, and the bass are preying on goby, maybe controlling their populations, because I think our only hope to control goby populations is through predat predatory um, processes. So these, these predators have the ability to eat a lot of gobies. And so the, the cool things about gobies are they're eating invasive uh, dracinid mussels, so they're changing our mussels. They're increasing fish growth, like I showed you, uh, they're also buffering other species from double-crested cormorant predation. So when we used to look at uh, cormorants' effects on fisheries, the, the cormorants would uh, affect the diversity of fish, but now they focus their, their diets on uh, gobies. So they're buffering those other species from consumption. So that's a pretty important uh, functional role. So, and it really has changed food web balance in the whole river. So the, the river's food web has completely been turned over and changed on its head um, uh, because of this species, bringing that energy from zebra mussels back up into the food web for our predators. So those are huge, uh, some people see as pros. And, and, but you look at cons, these gobies eat a lot of eggs. They're predators on eggs. They, they displace native fish, so there's a, a number of species that we monitor that we no longer see in our gear. One is like a tessellated darter, 
Uh, the sculpin species, which are also, also what we call benthic species, have been displaced by gobies. So they have big infects, effects on some of our native fish uh, that were formerly important in the ecosystem. They can affect angling. Um, sometimes fish are so satiated from eating gobies, good luck catching one. Um, and it's changed uh, distributions of fish. A big one is it's a vector for a disease that came in the same year is round goby, the year of the goby, which we call 2005. The guides could tell me where to catch gobies before that, but in 2005, they just came in mass. We call it the year of the goby. It's the first year they showed up in the DECs data set. And they're also spreading to other systems. So, you know, it, it started here and other places in the Great Lakes, and now they're spreading to other watersheds and, and, and having these, these issues. So, you know, you gotta, we study these trade-offs a great deal. Um, this is uh, some data from Slim Island. Slim Island's kind of across from Kring Point State Park. It's uh, in Canada, and uh, we have a colleague there uh, from the Illinois Natural uh, uh, Heritage uh, Group and, and also Queens Biological Station, Julie Clausen and da David Phillip. And back when I was studying pike and muskies in Point Marguerite Marsh, they were across the river mapping bass nests on Slim Island. And there was a, a big bass uh, nesting area here in between the island where it was kind of protected from uh, wave action and the water would kind of course through here and it was really good habitat. And they, they counted all the nests in 1991 and 92 and that was before these impacts of invasives really had taken hold in, the, in our ecosystem. And then uh, we went back and repeated those studies more recently in 2013 and uh, 14 um, and we saw some pretty big some pretty big differences, uh, and it, it's kind of uh, interesting data. So these are the total nest counts back in the 90s, you know, 120, 130 bass nests, and, and we counted the success of these nests. These are snorkel surveys, and that was by the production of black fry that come off the nest, and they would, they would uh, kind of hover and still be guarded uh, by the male uh, bass, and then uh, they would move off as they grew. And we, we, we had an estimate of the fry production, a couple hundred thousand fry coming from these nests. And we also looked at the effects of the angling. Um, so it kind of interacts with the season length of for bass. And, and we saw the number of hook wounds, you know, around 10 to 14 percent here for hook wounding. But when we repeated this study, there was a big distribution change. Uh, you might have noted in those, uh, those dots, uh, the fish were spawning deeper. Um, the total number of nests was close to the same, but a little less. But what was remarkable was the reduction in the success of those nests. So there was a, a, a really reduction in the success and the number of fry produced. And the other really remarkable thing was hook wounding rates, which you can see when a person catches a bass uh, and they release it, it leaves a hook wound. So you can see that on the bass's uh, jaw. And we saw. Uh, almost more than half the fish had these hook wounds showing that they had been caught by an angler um, during their nesting process. So it really highlights, you know, uh, how the season interacts with nesting in this data set, that we've had a change. And, and we've seen, we did a broader survey throughout the river and we see that smallmouth bass are nesting deeper throughout the St. Lawrence River. So we, we have some, some concerns about um, recruitment of bass. So it's one of these trade-offs. The gobies are making them fatter and bigger, but are we gonna be able to replace with young bass to, to support our fishery in the future? And that's kind of the million dollar question right now uh, as we monitor bass populations. And I, I could speak a whole talk about this, but I wanted to make everybody aware of that. These are some of the other uh, DEC species monitored, rock bass and sunfish. And uh, I, I, rock bass is this curve up here with the open, open uh, squares, or I mean the, the closed uh, diamonds. And you can see it's very similar to the smallmouth bass. Our rock bass, you know, are pretty abundant in the catch of these, these gill nets, uh, six to 10 or 12 per gill net. So the, the rock bass are still out there. But what's remarkable is the pumpkin seed sunfish has seen a, a tremendous decline in the river. So that's one of our sunfish species. Uh, we also have bluegill sunfish. So both of these are in the centrarchid family, uh, uh, the smallmouth, the rock bass, and the sunfish. And um, we, we're really kind of curious about what's going on here with pumpkin seeds. And, and that's kind of uh, how we use these data is to look at these trends and then ask questions about what's going on, what's driving that, 
And this is one of the, the questions that hasn't been answered, is why are sunfish populations declining in the catch in these gill nets? So that's something that we, we may look at in the future. Uh, but we have done studies on uh, centrarchid nest predation by, by uh, egg predators. Uh, we, I had a student, and I think she came here and spoke a few years ago, but she actually went around to nesting sites. She got to fish for her job, you know? How cool is that? So she got to go out and she would remove the guarding male on the nest and then quickly make observations about what predators would come in and attack that nest. And it was simulating an angle. And we decided to look at not just smallmouth bass, but also non-target fish that are caught by anglers uh, that could be affected. So that, that guarding male, it's an important process, but if you have hyper-abundant gobies around you, how, how much of an impact would that be on that success? So that was the question. What we saw was there's a whole slew of egg predators in the system, yellow perch, uh, uh, notropus is minnows, pumpkin seeds, uh, uh, these are bluegills. Rock bass and minnows were, were pretty important, but this is the big bar, which is round goby. And what was interesting was, is we made habitat measurements, and you can see that rock bass and smallmouth bass were really heavily impacted, over almost seven predators per nest uh, when they were removed, but pumpkin seeds were much, much lower. And what we found is, is the type of habitat that was selected for nesting kind of influences the type of predators that you're exposed to. Okay, so where you nest is important to what predators are going to eat your nest if you get caught by an angler. So that's just a, uh, another uh, question here uh, about egg predation. I wanted to show a video. I'm not quite sure how to do that. Okay, well this is a video of a nest being devoured by a bunch of round gobies and one perch. Um, if I had my computer I could start it, but I can't. Double click on... Oh, there it goes. So very rapidly, the uh, round gobies can consume all the eggs in the nest. And the saddest part about it is that the, and many times, the, the bass will go back on and sit on the nest after it's been done, or they'll sit there and watch this process. So um, you know, it's, it's something that goes on. And, and Save the River and other groups, including our agencies, have been concerned about how like uh, angling season dates interface with reproduction and making sure our fisheries are sustainable. So that's, that's one of the reasons why in the Thousand Islands there's been an opposition of pre-season angling. So just to give you an idea about that. And our data helped fuel that. So now moving on quite quickly to kind of the reason we exist at Tibbs was uh, to study the muscalunge. It's, it's one of our uh, marquee species here. Uh, the river is synonymous with muskies. Uh, it's, it's just uh, the top predator uh, in the ecosystem. You know, all other fish tremble in fear when a muskie's around, that kind of thing. And uh, we've gotten quite a bit of uh, notoriety and work and, and through this work. Uh, we recently got the cover of Fisheries Magazine. Uh, this is in Flynn Bay, uh, one of my students, and that, that was really exciting. And there's recently been a book that just came out on muscalunch management with a lot of work that came from here. And the point is, is uh, you know, not to like shamelessly promote like our research, but to say that the research that happens here in the river um, is kind of used throughout the Great Lakes Basin to help manage this species. So we're not, we don't do this in the vacuum. All the scientists here go to other meetings and, and share knowledge, and it's helping manage things just even beyond the, the St. Lawrence system. So Save the River was a big part of this. Uh, we, we've had some significant management highlights uh, back in the 80s, uh, Save the River with, the, with ESF um, and Andy Lyons started uh, giving, and the guides, most importantly, the guides and the anglers, gave out prints and hats and stuff instead of people keeping muskies and with their white flags coming into Clayton that they had a muskie on board. And we started releasing them and increasing the, the size limit at the same time, identifying critical habitat. There's like, these are all uh, important muscle and spawning and nursery sites that were identified through uh, binational effort between US and Canada. And the idea is we would protect these critical habitats, better manage the fishery, and, and uh, do, do some biological data and monitoring, and, and the, the fish population would come back, which it did. 
uh, until we had this massive outbreak of VHSV. So viral hemorrhagic septicemia is a new uh, genotype of a, a rhabdovirus that um, mutated and became uh, a Great Lakes strain and its muscle turn out to be very sensitive to it. Um, and we had a period of time where we were picking up musky carcasses all over the river for about a period of three years. Um, it was a really sad uh, time to witness. They were really large fish. Um, and, you know, we've been studying what, what impact this, this die-off has had on the system. Uh, we work a lot with Cornell. Uh, there's been work at Michigan State. This virus is mutating. There's, some, there's well over 70 different variants of the virus in the ecosystem. It's still here. And we believe that round goby are like the, the uh, competent reservoir for this virus. So the, the virus um, seems to interact with stress and gobies spawn multiple times a year. So they, they kind of harbor the virus, everything's eating them. It, it's shed in the water. So all our big predators get exposed to this virus when the temp water temperature is in a certain range. Um, so it's, it's uh, high prevalence in goby. So they're kind of a key to this process. So it's something we're very concerned about. And fortunately, we have this long-term data to look at its effects. We have a spring spawning index for muskie um, every year. Again, our crews are out checking trap nets throughout the river. And uh, you know we've seen, uh, since the HSB, a decline in our catches. This is uh, three of our, our main uh, spawning and nursery sites locally, Blind Bay, Flynn Bay, in Swan Bay, this is when the VHSV broke out. Things were going so well in 2000, they backed off the monitoring to every third year. We've resumed annual monitoring since the virus broke out, but you can just see from both sides of this graph kind of what's happened to uh, muskie populations in our spawning and nursery sites. Uh, Swan Bay has had its own series of insults. Uh, if you go over there, eutrophication, overdevelopment, uh, nutrients, uh, too much boat traffic, place is a mess, basically. I went over there last year and drove around and it, it, was, uh, it was sad. I think everybody remembers the, the famous uh, commercial with the Indian where he has the tear looking at the litter. It was almost like that kind of reaction when you go into some of these places in the Thousand Islands and you're like, what has happened here? Um, it's one of those kinds of, parts of it are very beautiful, but parts are, are just destroyed ecologically. And, and it doesn't produce any muskies anymore. It used to be a really important place. We have the data to show it, which is, is powerful to be able to show people that data. Um, we also have the Angler Diary Program uh, and, and dedicated anglers uh, for years have submitted diaries to track the fishery. And uh, what we're seeing in the fishery seems to track what we're seeing in the population. Uh, unfortunately, a decline. Um, this is effort here, slightly declined but the uh, catch rates have declined considerably over time. Uh, we have a this is how we assess our management goal. This was meeting our management goal. This is not meeting our man management goal of one muskie caught per 10 hours fished. Um, and, and the real topper here is reproduction. So if your population isn't reproducing, you're in big trouble. Uh, this is, uh, our, we have uh, 12 sites that we index through seining. Each one of these bars is 90 sane halls. To give you an idea of how much work goes in. We get a lot of volunteers. It's kind of like the turn thing, but we do standardized seining. And this is uh, pre-VHSV, and this is post-VHSV. So our, our numbers of young coming off our nursery grounds has declined, um, and I'm seeing I'm out of time. But um, round gobies have similarly increased. So we've seen this increase in gobies and a decline in young muskies. So we're really concerned about that. So we're trying to restore the muskie population um, and we uh, actually last year released 4,500 young of the year that we raised at Governor's Island. Each one has a tag in it that we can track. We did this at 51 sites. Uh, we plan on doing this the next four years to put a pulse into the population. And I have a graduate student studying VHSV and the immune response uh, to exposure to the virus. And we're hoping to rebuild the musky population and then let it naturally sustain. Uh, so this is a big experiment that we're doing now. Um, just briefly, I wanted to talk about northern pike. Uh, pike is another species that's de de declined dramatically. Um, and it, it, it could be, in large part, due to the quality of our uh, nursery areas and, and marshes. They run up and spawn along shorelines. And you can see in these photos of Cobb Shoal, which is right next to the Thousand Islands Bridge, 
the effect of invasive cattail. All these dark areas are that hemimarsh condition that we heard about earlier from Mike. And, and we've seen that these, these areas are filling in with cattails. So the bays are literally filling in throughout the, the Thousand Islands. And this is something that we battle daily. I hear it a lot because people can't get to their docks. They can't swim. And, and this litter of cattail decomposes in place and just increases what we call wetland accretion. So the wetlands filling in. You add like water level management on top of that that might be drawing the system down and you get some pretty tough situations for not just uh, fish and wildlife and boating alike. So um, water level conditions we know were very different this year. Uh, this is the last uh, six years or so. You know we had some good years and some droughty years and then here's this year. Um, and one of the bright spots is we, we do a lot of monitoring. So this is some, some really basic data, but we monitor the emigration of pike from wetlands, like French Creek and throughout the region. And uh, this is the monitoring since uh, 2011. And all of a sudden we get this giant peak, uh, and this is water level. And there's a really strong uh, correlation, 0.922, between water level and the number of pike that are emigrating from our wetlands. So, we have data to show what everybody is talking about, that there seems to have been a significant response to the flood in a positive direction for this species, which is really exciting. Um, and then uh, we heard earlier about uh, uh, some of the walleye work, uh, very important species here in the river. Um, and uh, a close cousin is the yellow perch. Uh, they're both from the genus Perca. And uh, perch, perch numbers have, have declined since the phosphorus reductions, but they seem stable. A lot of other areas in the, the Great Lakes, we've seen significant perch declines, um, but perch uh, seem to be hanging in there. They're not nearly as abundant as they used to be, uh, but their growth rates have increased as well. So we're seeing uh, pretty good perch populations. Um, but the really exciting one is walleye. Walleye, this is kind of a, a reverse thing where walleye were almost extirpated in the 70s. They were gone and they've just, uh, come back and become a major part of the ecosystem and fishery. Um, we have different strains of walleye. We know the genetic strains. Uh, there's a specific strain in Cape Vincent that's very genetically unique. There's the ones that Scott was talking about uh, in the lower river and the Black River that are genetically unique and then uh, Lake Ontario and then some other strains. So when you catch a walleye, it, it may come from a different stock because they mix in the river. Um, and uh, we, we uh, did an evaluation of that project that Scott talked about. This is that engineered riffle uh, project. And what's exciting is, is the walleye used it immediately. Um, and we saw really good uh, egg to survival ratio. We monitored with egg traps and out migration traps that catch the larvae. The walleye run up from the river and lake uh, and spawn in these riffles. And uh, they use this engineer riffle. And we compared it to a natural reference reef. And they actually outperformed a natural site. Um, the enhancements in gray. And uh, in the two different years, uh, we saw really high uh, egg catches and viability. Um, and then we. Um, we saw differences between the, the two years, and that's just due to environmental variability. Um, but we see that the, the way the, the reef's design gives it this interstitial spacing that protects the eggs from scour and also being washed out during higher flow events. So very, very exciting to see uh, that some of the projects are functioning. Um, so in summary, you know, you, you need to take a long, long-term perspective. We've taken a perspective over 12,000 years in our research to under, better understand the river. We do uh, deep core studies and pollen analysis right through to measuring year-to-year uh, -year variation. And uh, physical variables like water levels and flows are master variables which drive fish recruitment. Um, invasive species continue to alter community and create uncertainty in our system. It's like, what the hell's next? Um, native species hold top predatory roles still. So they're still king, our muskies, our walleye, our pike. So, so far, no Asian carp, knock on wood. So uh, protection, restoration, and management are the best things that we can be to good, be good stewards of our environment in the future. And I applaud all the people here that helped help us do that. So that's it. And uh, I just you know, want to thank, uh, this takes a lot of partners. Um, there's the Save the River Heron 
there's, you know, the land trust is another big one, but there's so many groups that contribute to these, these long-term efforts, uh, and we wouldn't be able to do it without them. And thanks for your time. Appreciate it.